What's going on? It's having a great day today. Today we're going to continue our discussion in the book of Job. We're going to be in chapter 40, verse 15 through verse 24, closing this chapter, and we'll be discussing the behemoth. And I must admit, before I get too far into this video, these are sort of teachings where I do not excel at. It's a lot of speculation. It's a lot of needing to know the original language to kind of get some of the meanings. But nonetheless, this is God's word. Nonetheless, we are going verse by verse through Job. So I'll do my very best. And of course, like I mentioned, it, the verses that we're going to be speaking of and reading here, it's a lot of speculation on what God is describing here, what animal he's describing, what beast he's describing. And so we must be careful. We must have liberty. Right? This is not some deep theological issue that we're discussing here. So there's much room for speculation. There's much room for liberty. But unless we want to take the text as what the text says, and we want to come to the best conclusion that we can from the words of God here spoken. But before we get into this, these verses, as we're going to see in verse 15, I want us to notice that God is, is saying this for a particular reason. God is not here just merely describing a behemoth or an animal or a beast for the mere sake of describing it. He is describing it in order to instruct us. In verse 15, he says, Behold. So God wants us to look upon the description of this beast, of this animal, and learn something from it. And we're going to discuss more about that, but we're obviously going to be learning about the power of God as he has been discussing throughout this chapter. It is the arm of God, the strength of God, that forms such a great animal, such a great behemoth. And thus we are not to contend with God, but trust in God because of his great and glorious power. So just kind of in brief introduction, what is the behemoth? In, in the just a simple term is, is it's an animal, it's a beast, it's some kind of thing that's not a human, some kind of creature that is physical. Right, a beast, most likely, a large animal, a large beast. And I do want to ask the question, is there one behemoth or are there multiple behemoth? See, one might think that he's describing a one particular creation of his, but the word is, to be, to be frank, plural. So it, the argument is, could be brought forth that it's a type of animal rather than one specific creature that God has formed. And I want us to be noticed, uh, noticed this as well, and that's why we have to be so humble and, and so not quick to, to be dogmatic in these conclusions. This is the only place in the Bible where it describes this behemoth. So there's not a whole lot of context. So right, when we go to a verse that is hard to understand, when we go to a verse that, that is more complex than just a simple reading, it's important that we take other scriptures to kind of understand the meaning of that scripture, knowing that the Bible does not contradict itself one bit. But being this is the only description of the behemoth, it's a very difficult passage to establish a broader and more general and more helpful context. And so, is this behemoth, is it a, a, a more modern creature, or is it some kind of dinosaur-type animal? is the question we all ask ourselves. There are many who would claim it is some kind of dinosaur, but there are many who would claim that it's some kind of modern creature that we even see here today. But truthfully, I guess if you want to kind of try to establish some sort of context, the very next chapter is about the Leviathan. As we discussed the, the Leviathan, the, the Leviathan surely does sound like a more unique kind of creation than what we see today. Now, we will discuss the, the Leviathan when we get there. Some people do claim it's a modern animal as well. But the Leviathan's description is much more mythical, if you will. Not mythical in the sense of fake, but the description of it seems to be more of a type of an animal that we don't really see today, that we don't really have an example of today. It's more unique in that sense. So possibly the behemoth is as well. In that same context of the behemoth and the Leviathan, it might be simply some kind of unique creation God formed. And again, I want to say we cannot be dogmatic in our conclusions. Because again, it's not... The description of this animal is not some theological necessity of ours to, to know it. But the principle surely is that God is sovereign, that God is mighty, that God is powerful, and we are to yield ourselves to him. But as we go here to Job chapter 40, verse 15 through verse 24, we see the characteristics of the behemoth. And I'm going to just read these verses and then kind of just walk through them of, of my thought process, of, of how my mind works through these verses. But here in Job chapter 40, verse 15, the Bible says this, Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee. He eateth grass as an ox. Lo, now his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. 
The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food, where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fins. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. He taketh it with his eyes. His nose pierceth through snares. So again, as I mentioned at the beginning, God starts out in verse 15, Behold now behemoth. So God is instructing us. God is teaching us through the description of this beast, through the description of this behemoth. And we will first notice in verse 15, it says, which I made with thee. So it's important here that God, we, we see that God made the behemoth. And of course, this is obvious, but it's important. As we're discussing God's characteristics of God's power, of God's glory, we have seen time and time again, especially in the last chapter, that God formed all things. God formed the animals. God formed the beasts, just as God formed man. And so that puts God in a, in a, t in a class, in a category higher than all creation because he is the creator. He is God. And so he says, I made the behemoth with you. Likely referring to that same day he made man. Of course, he made the animals before he made man. But also in verse 15, he says he eateth grass as an ox. So at the bare minimum, we see that this behemoth is an omnivore. So it's not a carnivore. It does not only eat meat. We see it eats grass like an ox. So you could say it's a herbivore. But the bare minimum, it's an, at least an omnivore. Because it ma majorly eats grass. And it's kind of a funny thing to think about the, the providence of God in forming such great and mighty creatures that could trample many of its prey and destroy many animals and take much life. Yet we see that even these great creatures so often are herbivores, or at least omnivores, where most of their diet consists of, of fruits and vegetables. So you see a mighty creature, yet by the providence of God, it's not an aggressive creature that, that eats flesh, but vegetables, but vegetation. But then also in verse 16, we said this animal is large. It has large and, and strong thighs and a belly. Therefore, it must be relatively large. In verse 16, lo, now his strength is in his loins. So we see his strength, the greatness is in his loins and his thighs and his force is in the navel of his belly. So once again, it has to be some kind of large animal to have this kind of strength in its thighs and belly. And in verse 17, it says, He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. And a lot of people translate that sinews of his stones is talking about his thighs once again. But we see that he appears to have a large sweeping tail. It says it moves his, his tail like a cedar, like a cedar tree. So based off just a, a simple reading, it appears that this animal has a large tail. A very large, strong tail, a hard, straight tail, as a cedar tree is. However, I want us to be open to the idea that maybe it's just showing that it moves like a cedar, that its tail moves kind of like a cedar, not saying that its tail is actually like the size of a cedar tree. And I say that because it says he moveth his tail like a cedar. So it does not say that his, it is not necessarily describing the strength of his tail, it is not necessarily describing the size of his tail. But it's just saying that its tail moves like that of a cedar. And so there could just be some, some symbolic language there rather than an objective, like, absolute physical description of it. But then in verse 18, we said this behemoth has thick, dense, and strong bones. And this is, of course, congruent with its large frame. A large animal with big thighs and a big belly is going to have a big bones to support the weight of this, this belly and these thighs. So he see has thick, dense, strong bones. And then in verse 19, we see kind of a more interesting verse here about the description of it. That it says that it is the chief ways of God. It says he is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword approach unto him. First, I want to kind of talk about the second portion. He that made him can make his sword approach unto him. Some other translations kind of make the idea that this behemoth has the sword. Rather that God made the behemoth and God gave the behemoth the sword. In, in another sense, like, like teeth, sharp teeth, big teeth, to chew up the vegetation. 
But in another sense, we could say that only God can approach such a beast. Only God can slay such a beast. Only God can establish such authority and power over a large beast as this. Why? Because God made it. Right? He that made him can make his sword approach unto him. So God made the beast. God can slay the beast. God can destroy the behemoth in the same way that God made the behemoth. And of course, this is absolutely true. But as we're going to see, if we take some more modern, modern interpretations of this animal, and we see it's a sort of a modern creature, we can clearly see that as far as we know, there's no modern creature where man cannot actually slay. With all the advances in technology, man can conquer almost any animal. So it may not be that, that, that dogmatic statement that only God can, can slay such a beast. But it is again just to teach us the power of God. That God formed the beast. God can take the beast's life. That God is above all things. But as we look at the first portion of verse 19, he is the chief of the ways of God. Now this word chief can be translated first. So he is the first of the ways of God. Now I suppose this can be taken many ways. Many people take it as just talking about the greatness of the beast. That he's chief, he's first. That, that he's such a powerful beast. Such a great behemoth. That he is great. And that's really all it's saying there. Some take it to mean that he was made before all the other animals. That he was the first animal created. Again, we can't really prove that just from this simple reading of the text. But we must not negate this fact. We cannot read too much into the text. That says that the behemoth is the chief ways of God. One of the, the greatest creations of God. But surely, man being made in God's image is greater. So we cannot read this text and, and think that an animal's life is greater than a man's life, or that an animal's value is far above a, a man's value. Because surely man is greater than animals, in the sense that man has a soul. Man is formed in the image of God, unlike any animal. So in that sense, man is the greatest creation, just because he's been made by God in a special way, to be made in God's own image. But if we talk about just being made first, being made chief in the beginning is what it's speaking of. So example, if it's, if it's a modern day animal that we see today, clearly an animal born today of that species, of that behemoth type, is not before a man born 200 years ago. But it'd be merely just speaking in the beginning, not necessarily following generations or, or later generations. But this is important for God's instruction towards Job. We must not, not miss this. Namely, man did not create such great beasts only God created such things. So if we're looking at the just the chronological view of this, where it's the chief ways, the first ways of God, that, that God made the beast, the behemoth, before he made man. The behemoth was living before man. The behemoth was able to provide for itself before man. Thus, we are to conclude that, that man is not sovereign over animals, over creation. Yes, man has dominion, but God is sovereign, and God provides, and God is far greater over the animals than man. As we go to verse 20 to verse 23, we see a more geographical argument that can be drawn from this. In verse 20, it says, Surely the mountains bring him forth food, where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fins. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river and hasteth not. He trusted that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. So we see a sort of geographical description of where this behemoth is located. So it says, surely the mountains bring him forth food. So this behemoth is in a mountainous region with large enough trees to provide shade. And, and mountains more liberally can be translated as hills. It doesn't have to be some kind of like rocky mountain, but there's like hills. It's not a flat, barren land. There are, are hilly areas with trees and shade and, and water. And other translations kind of trans, translate the, the word trees here to lotus, lotus plants. And lotus plants are, are abundantly located in marshy and watery areas. Therefore, we can conclude this behemoth is located in a marshy area with reeds and brooks, with water, kind of like a swampy type of area. And so we see there geographically where this animal, the behemoth, was located at the time God was speaking of this. I do also want to point out in verse 20, though, where it says where all the beasts of the field play, we see again that this animal, though it's great in stature, great in size, great in power, 
it is not an aggressive animal in the sense that it is not seeking to to harm these physical animals that play in the field. They're able to play around this animal without fear of being harmed by it. So we see it's a more passive, docile animal in that regard. Docile behemoth. But I also want us to notice this kind of interesting thing. If the behemoth is able to hide itself under trees and get shade, it was able to take covert in, in the brush. As it says here in verse 21, he lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fins. He's able to kind of like hide himself even in the tall grass, in the marshy areas. I think it's reasonable to conclude that this behemoth cannot be such a large creature that shade would be impossible. Which it seemingly rules out dinosaur type creatures. I say seemingly because I don't, I don't know. But you think of like some kind of like brontosaurus, some kind of large herbivore that we, we look at dinosaurs. And especially in the more modern time where vegetation isn't as large it would kind of be strange to think this animal could fit underneath a tree or fit in, in the marshy brush and still have be hidden and have shade there. So it seems to be a creature that is large, but not so abundantly large where it's impossible to shade itself. But also in verse 23, you see the behemoth is not terrified of water, nor is it a timid creature. That when it goes to drink water from the, the river, it is not fearful of, of predators because it's so large and so big that it, it really has no threats, has no predators that can overtake it. But also we see the idea that it's like if the waters were to rage, if the wa waters were to overcome this animal, the animal would not be worried. The animal would not be scared to flee, which kind of points to the idea that maybe this animal is amphibious, that it kind of lives in the water as well as lives on land, that it can, it can really sur survive and prosper in both types of uh, of living conditions whether it be a floody marshy area whether it be kind of a more dry ground the animal is able to traverse both of them with relative ease and it's not afraid of rising waters of gushing rivers and then also just another thing i point out about verse 23 the mention of the jordan may indicate it is in a middle eastern region of course that's where the, the jordan river is right it's like around israel in the northeast israel in the in the Middle Eastern area, in the Middle Eastern region. So it's either that, or God is just using this as an example since Job is familiar with it. God is just using this idea of the Jordan River since Job is likely, he likely knows about the Jordan River. So he's using that as a reference point to just show the might and power of this animal. And then in verse 24, we see the behemoth is valiant. He is difficult to capture and to kill. In verse 24, he taketh it with his eyes. His nose pierceth through snares. So he takes it with his eyes. Some translate that he takes the, the river with his eyes. But some just take it as the fact that this behemoth, if his eyes are upon a predator, if his eyes are behind a, be, uh, upon a man trying to take his life, if he sees the man, then he will not be overcome. Now a man might be able to take him by, by surprise, you know, lay a trap before him and capture him and kill him that way. But the idea here might be that the behemoth just sees him and knows he's there. Then this man cannot overtake the behemoth because it's such a valiant and mighty creature. And we see it's kind of the same idea in that later portion of verse 24. His nose pierced through snares. That so a man tries to snare him and tries to trap him. But so long as he sees the man, the man cannot succeed in trapping him. The man cannot succeed in killing him. Again, just pointing to the might of the creature. So as we come to the kind of the conclusion, again, like I said, this is kind of hard to teach on for me anyways. I'm not a very good uh, teacher on just simple verses where it's just, just describing things. But nonetheless, it's important. And nonetheless, the, the major conclusion of God's power and glory, even over the behemoth, is what we are to focus upon, I believe. But in terms of modern-day animals, it is likely, it seems to me, that a hippopotamus fits much of the description. Someone argued an elephant. And, and the elephant is a more passive and mighty creature. I will, I will grant it that. Right In verse 20, we see it's a passive creature. The hippopotamus, while it is an omnivore, while it is a passive creature in some ways, can also be a very aggressive creature. Especially a, a territorial creature. While the elephant seems to be a bit more passive. And a bit more docile. 
But again, to me, it seems to be the hippopotamus. Right? We see a large creature that mostly eats plants. It hides in marshy waters. It's known to be in the Middle Eastern reg regions, and it is amphibious, which, which fits much of the description of hippopotamus. And I will come to the caveat to that. Again, we saw that its, its tail moved like a cedar. And that appears to be the only, or at least the, the most odd part of the description that wouldn't really fit a hippopotamus if you take it in that literal meaning of, of it being a long, a long tail. But that wouldn't hit, fit the, hippopot or the, the elephant either. Right? Well, hip hippos and elephants are mighty great creatures, yet their tails are very small. Their tails are almost like little ropes that just swing around on their, on their rear. But yet I cannot think of a land, land animal with a large tail. That would else fit this description. So either the tail is symbolic, just saying that it moves like a cedar, not that it is big and, and strong like a cedar, just moves like a cedar, and in some way that's symbolic of something. Or the passage could be speaking of a dinosaur type animal, which has a long tail that would fit the description of a cedar tree. But then again, I must ask what about the fact that it takes shade in marshy areas? That doesn't seem very congruent with a large dinosaur type creature. But again, I'm not dogmatic on this. I, I, I truly do not know in full clarity. But I, I want us to not miss it. And I've, I've already touched on it a little bit, but this is the important matter. We are to learn from God through his description of the behemoth, whatever animal it might be, whatever creature it might be. That is little importance. So long as we get the idea that God is teaching us here, that God is speaking about his power as he will do in the next chapter when he describes Leviathan. He's again teaching Job the mighty hand of God, the sovereign hand of God, the providential workings of God to create such great creatures, to create such great behemoths, to create man after he was done forming the animals. So we're to see God as the sovereign creator and man as the humble creation. That is the point here. But firstly, God formed this great creature along with all of the other things. So if God formed such a great creature, whether it be a hippo, whether, whether it be an elephant, whether it be some great dinosaur type creature, which we, we don't know uh, to exist at the, at the present time as elephants and hippos do, God formed this great behemoth. God formed this great creature, which is large in statute, which has great power in its thighs and belly, which cannot be taken by the hand of a man very easily. God formed it. Secondly, God here is showing man's inability to conquer such beasts. Again, as we saw in verse 19 and verse 24, verse 19, it says in the second portion of it, he that made him can make a sword approach unto him. So either only, only God can approach this beast since he made it, or else God gave this beast sword-like teeth, powerful, strong teeth, which is able to defend itself with. And then in verse 24, he takes it with his eyes, his nose pierced it through snares. Again, just showing the, the difficulty to capture and to kill such a great beast as this. And I do want to point out, it's so easy for us to take a look at our modern technology, to, to look at our, our new inventions, a gun, a, a tank, a, a attack helicopter, right? We could easily destroy most animals that we come across if we really wanted to. But if we take away man's brain, if we take away man's inability, or his, take away his ability to make such great technological advances, man is weaker than most animals. If you were to try to charge a hippopotamus with just your bare hands, you would surely lose. Same thing with an elephant. If we were to charge him with a club, we'd probably still lose very quickly. So we just see that with, without the brain of man to help him create such tools for his disposal, he would surely be crushed by a hippo and stand no chance. So again, we already see the frailty of man, the weakness of man. In some ways, that's probably why this hippo or, or elephant or dinosaur creature is called the chief ways of God. It's mighty, it's powerful, it's strong and glorious in strength. And while man is greater because he's made in the image of God, in terms of physical stature, in terms of physical ability, he would quickly be crushed by such a behemoth. So the conclusion here is, we are no match for such a great creature. We are no match for such great a great behemoth. So why do so many think that they are a match for God, the creator of that behemoth? 
the creator of them. It is utter folly. If God formed the world, which he did, if God formed the behemoth, which he did, as we'll see in the next chapter, if, if God formed the Leviathan, which he did, if God formed you, which he did, then it is utter foolishness. It is unwise to the nth degree to try to claim dominion over God, to try to rebel against God, to try to raise oneself up over God. And it will surely lead to destruction. Just as if you were to try to charge a hippo with your bare hands and, and, and punch it to death, you would surely be destroyed. In the same way you try to raise yourself up against God, in a greater sense you will be destroyed. So we are here called to yield to God. We are called to submit ourselves to God. But also we are called to trust God in His great power. To the Christian, we're called to trust the Lord. He forms all things. He sustains all things. He upholds all things by His power and wisdom. We are called to trust Him. We are called to walk with Him by faith. Knowing that God will provide. Knowing that He is able and knowing that He is faithful. God will surely provide. So trust God, yield to God, recognize the great power of the behemoth, recognize our own frailty, and in light of that, recognize the great power and glory of God. Submit to Him, yield to Him, walk with Him, and just trust Him in all things. Always remember you're not alone. Jesus loves you, I love you. Have a blessed rest of your day.